Ryan Stanton here with ASAP Frontline, joined today by Dr. Karen Eigen and Dr. George Diaz. And we're going to talk about uh, confronting ammonia in the ED from sepsis to liver disease to other rare manifestations. Um, this is one that, uh, that uh, is probably not on the first list of topics that you're looking for when you head to scientific assembly, but one that we deal with a fair amount within the emergency department. And uh, we're going to talk with them and ask the questions about uh, elevated ammonia, how it plays a role in the emergency department, and uh, then what we can do about it, the risks of high ammonia, and then when to be concerned about it. So uh, I appreciate both of you joining us here on the front line. And, um, you know, first and foremost, just kind of give us a background, an idea of, of how we as a team became focused on uh, elevated ammonia in the emergency department. Sure, absolutely. So I am a pediatric emergency room physician. I've been practicing for about 23 years um, and married to a geneticist. So um, I, I do have a metabolic program in the ER where I work. So we do see patients with metabolic disease occasionally um, and thinking a lot about um, when we need to work a patient up for a new presentation about it. So, um, and, you know, happen to be married to a geneticist. So it's something that's probably a little bit more on my mind than, than other people's. So with that, I'll let George go. Yeah. So um, I'm a, a geneticist at, at Mount Sinai in New York. I've been there for um, 25 years. And we have one of the largest uh, metabolic disease programs uh, around. Um, so this is kind of uh, my bread and butter. Uh, I'm a uh, site PI for the uh, Rare Disease Clinical Research Network, uh, Urea Cycle Disorders um, uh, clinical programs. And um, so really, these, these types of patients um, are my uh, strong research uh, interest. And so I, I manage a lot of patients with this condition and um, you know, have consulted um, with a lot of uh, folks uh, kind of in the region and around the country. Let's just walk through some of the um, uh, some of the basics. Let's start from the beginning here, and let's just go with some of the things that are going to tip us off in the emergency department to start looking for ammonia as the culprit, an elevated uh, ammonia level, uh, hyperammonemia. And I knew that this was going to be one of the words. Like my mom has trouble mm -hmm. saying cellular. Um, hyperammonemia is one that just it, it's going to trip me up for some reason. Um, the entire time, I'm just going to say that it's maybe my, uh, from being here in central Kentucky, that something in the water makes it difficult to put those letters together. But let's talk about some of those common symptoms and presentations that may um, may warrant a consideration and further investigation of elevated ammonia levels. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll kind of start off with uh, the metabolic genetics perspective. Um, Hypermanemia is really nonspecific. You know, it's, it's problematic because... Um, it can present um, really at any age. You know, these diseases can present commonly in uh, in infancy, and so this is you know where you uh, learn ab about it in, in medical school. You know, kind of the hyperammonemic crisis and with OTC deficiency and so on. Uh, but pa patients can get uh, unmasked if they have an underlying predisposition to a hyperammonemic condition uh, at any point in life, um, and the symptoms are generally um, vague uh, initially. So even in infancy, it's pretty vague. Um, so you've got a little, you've got some change in mental status. Uh, you know, patients might get a little bit um, hyper excitable. You know, if they're older, um, you know, they uh, might actually start to um, act differently, a little aggressively, and then you get a, a little bit of depression of the sensorium, and um, it, they'll start to um, really kind of cruise on into coma. Um, before that happens, usually they'll get they'll get nauseous and they'll start vomiting. Um, so the high levels of ammonia are going to trigger. Um, you know, this, this gut response, that they'll be vomiting. Um, so that's, that's frequent, but that doesn't sound, you know, really specific. That could be any patient. So uh, a vomitor in the ER is just nothing um, that you're going to be too concerned about. Uh, and that's part of the, the concern, the, you know, the real risk for these patients is um, they come in, they look like every other patient and um, you're going to miss the opportunity to intervene because as the ammonia gets progressively higher, you get increasing neurological damage and uh, eventually becomes irreversible. And while we're at it, let's, um, um, you know, you mentioned some of those consequences of, of, of missing this. And, you know, it's not something that's going to be on that primary radar. So, Dr. Eigen, if it's suspected, what are the things that we're going to do to further investigate and confirm this as our uh, diagnosis? And is there anything 
uh, special than an ammonia level uh, within the emergency department? So the only way to pick it up is to get an ammonia level. Um, so the first thing you have to do is think to get an ammonia level, which we frequently do not. And as George just said, a lot of the patients present with very common complaints, right? Vomiting, lethargy. These are things that we see all the time in the ER. So you, you really have to have a little bit of a suspicion before you even order the test. And then once you order the test, you have the added challenges of getting the specimen done properly to the lab, you know, quickly process quickly because it's, you know, very commonly you get erroneously high levels if the test is not done correctly. So um, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. It has to be a free flowing sample, right? I'm sure you know, and um, that's, you know, not an easy thing to accomplish, especially in a dehydrated patient or a young patient or even an elderly patient. So it's, it's you know, again, first step is thinking of it, ordering it, and then getting the test. So with that in mind, Dr. Diaz, um, in your experience, you know, it, it, we clearly, this isn't clearly part of the, the standard panel that's going to come in, especially, you know, altered mental status, uh, confusion, whatever it may be. When somebody comes in the emergency department, a lot of times it does have to uh, have a high index of suspicion. And so it probably is ordered on a significant minority of cases. And then, and even then potentially um, once the, we don't have an an, another answer for uh, the syndrome or the symptoms that are presenting, um, what are what are some of the things or protocols you can put in place or or team members or resources that you may want to have available uh, when you start putting ammonia uh, elevated ammonia levels on the differential? Yeah, so that, that's uh, that's a great question. I think um, really the the thing that should maybe trigger uh, a, a consideration for uh, ammonia testing is is the clinical history. I mean, I, I don't think that anybody that comes in first time vomitor know really. Uh, significant medical history, antecedent symptoms is going to merit having ammonia done. It's just way too common. Your yield is too low. But if you've got somebody that has a, a recurrent history of unexplained vomiting, um, you know, somebody that uh, after, um, you know, every holiday, they, you know, Thanksgiving, big, big protein load um, is vomiting. Um, somebody who, who has a history of avoiding, you know, um, high protein foods. Like we, we've got patients who will tell you, yeah, we, we, I had a hamburger, but all they eat is the bun. You know, they never eat the meat you know, that kind of thing. So you get, again, it all comes back to index of suspicion. You ask a couple of questions um, and if it's suggestive, then maybe you'll think, okay, this is somebody who, you know, is um, got some aversive behaviors with food, has had this happen a few times, um, you know, and kind of has improved and nobody really knows why. Um, maybe then you can consider. Um, the other thing to consider is liver function tests. A lot of the patients with uh, underlying urea cycle disorders will have some elevation of transaminases during decompensation events. Um, and so that can be a clue. We've had a number of referrals from gastroenterologists who've had kids being worked up or adults being worked up for liver disease. Uh, and you know, then they send them to us for metabolic evaluations because they're not finding anything. And it turns out these patients have a urea cycle disorder. Let's actually talk about that a little bit, um, because I think when all of us think about uh, elevated ammonia levels, we're thinking about um, the classic you know, liver related disease, hepatic encephalopathy and the chronic alcohol patient. Uh, but, you know, both of you have mentioned a lot of focus on pediatric, younger, or otherwise healthy populations. What's the differential diagnosis? Let's just say we went about it backwards and we got it. Somebody got an ammonia level. It's elevated. It's just sitting there. Um, what's my, what's a good, d decent differential diagnosis that emergency physicians need to throw in there if it's not a classic population of, um, of liver disease where it's obvious what the primary source is going to be? Right. So first thing is making sure that the test is done right. Right. So that's my, my number one source of referrals is uh, hyperaminemia with a sample where you've got a tourniquet on, sample wasn't free-flowing, sample wasn't put on ice, wasn't processed immediately. You're going to get an artificially elevated level. Um, so, you know, just making sure that, that this collection was done appropriately. Um, and if it's a true hyperaminemia, um, then you kind of want to consider a couple of things. If you're um, in a pediatric age group, um, one of the things that you want to look at is growth, growth and development. Is this a child that's got developmental issues, a child that's got growth issues from aversive behaviors, you know, eating potentially? Um, you know, if you see other things, um, then you can, I think, start to put together a differential of underlying metabolic disease that might explain this elevated ammonia level. 
Uh, and that doesn't have to be just a urea cycle defect, right? So that can be in underlying organic acidemia where you've got a secondary hyperemonemia. Um, you know, so any one of these metabolic diseases um, that interfere with the, the appropriate functioning of the liver uh, to metabolize ammonia can give you this secondary hyperemonemia. Um, you know, you, you also have anatomic defects to consider, right? So hyperemonemia from, from uh, portal shunting. Um, if you're talking about an older age uh, population, um, think about medication. So valproic acid um, is kind of a classic that can cause elevation of, of ammonia uh, and, uh, you know, kind of affecting the ability of the liver to process appropriately. And uh, if you're looking um, at somebody who's had surgery, you know, think about uh, bacterial overgrowth. So I've had uh, definitely some cases where people have come in for hyperemonemia, did a full evaluation for a primary urea cycle defect, and there was none. Um, but really, they'd had a surgical history, um, treated with antibiotics, you know, kind of got rid of the bacterial overgrowth, and so the urease positive bacteria that were cleaving uh, urea and producing ammonia is kind of the, the root cause there. So you know, it, I think that that um, is the again looking at the history, looking at the patient and the context, you know, it gives you an idea of what what might be causing hyperemia. And you know, Dr. Eigen, um, uh, Dr. Diaz was mentioning the, you know, some of the challenges with the testing and getting the tests. And uh, that's actually something, you know, I, I, I teach my students quite often is if you get a test that is um, significantly abnormal that you're not expecting, the first first and foremost thing is to recheck the test or confirm the test, especially when you're dealing with electrolytes, but ammonia sounds like it's, it's similar. Um, and when you, for us in the emergency department, we're talking about accurately obtaining uh, ammonia levels, you know, whether it's in the adult or pediatric populations, is what are the things that we need to consider in educational standpoints that we need to do to make sure that we're getting accurate testing when we're uh, in the emergency department and then some of the challenges that may come up with that? So the, the very first thing you need to do is to make sure you have the correct tubes, right? So it's a green top tube that goes on ice. So everybody needs to be aware of that. Um, and if it's a pediatric population, you want the smaller tubes so that you can get an adequate sample. So you need to have the tubes. You need to have a plan in place of how you're going to get that tube to the lab because time is of the essence. And then you need to know that your lab knows how to process it. So if you sent the test and it's an hour and a half has gone by and you don't have a result, that increases the likelihood that you're going to get a false positive because if the blood is sitting around, it may not um, be an accurate um, level. So it's really about having a plan in place, which is a lot easier in a center where you see metabolic patients regularly because then you're you're doing the test sort of you know, periodically. And so you can sort of test your planning, but if you don't do it regularly, probably the first time you send it, you're going to get an erroneously high high level. And, um, and it's something that you have to always consider, um, especially if the other labs are normal, which frequently they are. I mean, sometimes you get the, the little clue of the elevated LFTs, but many times, you know, you have a kid who maybe has a little bit of a low blood sugar. So that explains the lethargy, and the LFTs and everything else is normal. So um, it's really important to like sort of do a dry run of the process with your ER and with your lab and you know what your phlebotomy team is capable of or your nurses are capable of. And sometimes it does take a doctor going in there and, and doing an arterial blood draw to get a reliable sample. With that in mind, though, um, you know, it sounds like you, you guys mentioned the free flowing sample tourniquets off that sort of thing. Um, is there any batch or grouping of labs along with it other than the time? Because I think when you start saying if you don't have it back in an hour and a half, it's kind of like the old saying, if I'm not back in an hour and a half, just wait longer kind of approach. Um, and then if you call them, of course, it'll be ready in five minutes is is most of our labs are going to have some sort of delays you know processing times phlebotomy times times that it you know for for the sample to actually get obtained sent up there run all that stuff uh, and most of us very few of us live in a, a in an ideal situation where those things turn quickly are there things that we look for if we get an elevated ammonia level that may tip off that it is um a compromised sample or is it just or is it just that if it 
seems out of place or potentially rechecking it that, that we need to just question it if it doesn't fit the presenting symptoms? Yeah. So, um, one of the, um, clues is our lab will reject samples for hemolysis. And so, you know, if you've got a, an obviously hemolyzed sample, you know, it's a colorimetric test. Um, you know, labs may not run it. Um, or if they run it, you, you, again, you may get a falsely elevated result because, you know, the readout's not, not good. Um, so, you know, that's definitely something that, that you want to, you, you can actually maybe spot check that. Um, but the lab will let you know if the sample is inadequate um, from hemolysis. You know, the, the rest of it, like with, with time, it, you know, it, you're kind of getting um, metabolism going on in the cells in the sample over time. And so, you know, there's nothing you can do at the point of collection, you know, it, un unless you know that there's a tourniquet on. So that's going to artificially elevate the ammonia. But if you're free flowing and you know it's on ice and the sample went in good shape, uh, but it's not getting processed in the lab, you know, there's really no way to know. And that's just you watching the clock. To be honest with you, sometimes I just give it a shot with the labs that are initially drawn. And if it's normal, you don't have to worry about it, right? So even if the blood was taken with a tourniquet on, if you have a normal ammonia that's run in a reasonable amount then of time, then, then you can take that off of your differential. So if it's elevated and I don't feel like sure that it was a great blood draw, then I'll repeat it. Yeah. When you see with the blood samples, like a lot of times now we're using these, uh, using the ultrasound guide to getting more middle, uh, middle veins as opposed to the really superficial veins with the challenging sticks. Um, is, does that tend to uh, behave better because the, the, the less tourniquet um, impact or is, or does it really not matter? And we just need to try our best to make sure we got a, we just get the free flowing sample, no matter uh, that source minus a deep line, which, we all know that that kind of that source there. Yeah, I, I'm not aware of any data kind of kind of looking at, at that. That's an actually a really interesting question. Um, you know, whether there's going to be a variation, um, you know, kind of uh, depending on how deep a, a vessel lies. Um, so I, I, I think for for now, absent any data, I would suggest you know just you know doing a, a good free flowing sample and. Yeah, no, I think that's a great thought because we are doing a lot more ultrasound guided um, procedures. But once you are talking about that, then you have a physician in the room already, and then you may as well just get the arterial sample, you know? So, um, but if in that case, I think you probably could get a more reliable sample. It's something yeah. to think about for the future. Gives, gives you an opportunity for some great research coming up. Congratulations. <laughs> I just gave you work to do. Um, <laughs> I'm going to name my R1 grant after you. It's going to be great. Oh, that'll be awesome. That'll, that'll be something that I never would have ever seen com uh, coming was one, yeah. me being involved with or any research named after me and two, it having to do anything with ammonia. Um, but that would be awesome. Uh, and it would be cool to find out stuff because I do love some ultrasound guided IVs. But now we've got the information. We've got a great sample. Everybody's done everything correctly. The lab's the lab is is behaving. Everything comes back in a timely fashion. We've got accurate numbers, and we have an elevated ammonia uh, level. Now we're not going to delve into the treatment aspect of this because we really want to just look at the, you know, the ammonia itself, and then you know what are the resources in terms of um, folks to help manage. And because once we have it, now we have to do something about it. Like the whole idea in the emergency department, go don't go looking for something in unless you can deal with it or or have a plan for it once you find it. So what are the role of, of specialists and, and the, with the diagnosing and management and bringing those in and, and getting involvement within the emergency department? Good. So what I do is I call George. Um, but what, what should... That's other... exactly what I'm going to do as well. <laughs> um, what should other ERs do? Yeah. So, I mean, I think um, if, if you're in an academic medical center, you know, generally this is a no-brainer because you've got your consultants plugged in. Uh, you know, you, if you don't have genetics, uh, usually there's endocrinologists uh, or somebody kind of plugged in for metabolic disease. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, the, the care team for any hyperemic patient that's uh, primary hyperemia uh, should always involve a geneticist uh, at some level if it's kind of a distant consultant or, or uh, patient managing directly. Um, we always involve nephrology um, because, you know, the, the need or dialysis in extreme hyperemia. So you kind of got to look at the level and see if you've got a patient that's obtunded and the ammonia is in the hundreds, um, you know, the need for dialysis is probably going to be jumping edge pretty quickly. So you want to engage uh, nephrology uh, really um, early in the game and kind of get them ready uh, for that possibility. 
um, because you know the the rest of the management really is about preserving um, the the brain, and you know um, so the brain is kind of getting it um, is swelling over time. You're going to get cerebral edema as a consequence of of high and sustained ammonia levels. Um, so you know that's kind of where you need to aim your um, your your team. When you're sitting in our community house, most of, most of the folks listening are going to be community based physicians, um, and you know it's it's like today. Uh, I had a patient ask me to um, call and have so that their endocrinologist could come see them in the emergency department. Of course, during a pandemic. And I laughed so hard that I almost passed out because I don't I don't know that if we gave them a map and a and and sent them a Google pin, uh, they'd necessarily be able to find the uh, emergency department uh, because most community phys- facilities and, and community physicians, endocrinologists aren't necessarily going to frequent the emergency department. Uh, you can refer; we have great referral. They, they're happy to see our folks, but really don't do any of that urgent based stuff. So most of our physicians out there are going to be in a community based system where they're not going to have. Uh, the geneticist, uh, they're not going to have the um, endocrinologist at ready standby. Uh, of course, the majority of ER time is after hours uh, or off hours. Um, and so not necessarily any clinics open that you can call and, and run it by folks. What if I get this number, if I get this elevated number, and it's not an easy explanation as term, in terms of what's going on, uh, or if I'm looking at it in a pediatric population, looking at some of the uh, congenital or developmental issues, who do, when we call that tertiary referral or academic center, what are we asking for and what are we looking for? Right. So in, in, if you're managing somebody who is um, got a high ammonia level is obtunded and is going to need some tertiary care, um, you're going to want somebody that can transport that patient to a high level of care um, rapidly. And, you know, again, with uh, hyperaminemia, you don't necessarily need a metabolic geneticist, you know, it, uh, as the first step, you need somebody that can drop an ammonia quickly. And so that typically means getting them to a center where they can do dialysis, stabilize the patient, um, and kind of move them along to a specialist for longer term management. Um, The other thing that really is important here is uh, for patients that have an underlying metabolic disease, catabolism is really um, kind of their enemy. And a lot of these patients usually will have had some kind of viral uh, syndrome, you know, they've had vomiting, uh, gastro, something kind of tips them over. Um, so it's really important to try to reverse that process. And usually that means giving them some dextrose, giving them some source of energy while, while they're unable to, uh, you know, kind of take anything in um, orally to uh, kind of replete their energy. So that's something that you can do in the ED. You know, if you've got a patient that has a high ammonia level, just fluids, um, you know, kind of basic electrolytes isn't going to really get at the root problem, which is sometimes just, you know, they need energy. So you give them some dextrose, give them D5, D10, whatever you got, um, that can kind of help stabilize them. Um, and then you can move them along. I'd like to get both of y'all, uh, both of your thoughts on, you know, this aspect of things. And, and because I think we all know, uh, anybody been in emergency medicine for a while knows that ammonia level is not by a number. It's not a, it's not a, you know, a linear scale of this number equals this badness. Um, you know, depending on where somebody sits on baseline, uh, a, a high number for one is going to be basically nothing for the other. Uh, whereas that high number for the high number, there's nothing for one can be, you know, it's going to be life threatening, debilitating for the other. Are there things, what are the things that the emergency and acute care physicians uh, and other healthcare providers need to look at to say this number is not only a, a significant number, but a time sensitive number that they have a high likelihood of near term deterioration. Um, for both the adult and pediatric population. Do you have a number, an exact number? Yeah, so that, that's very. Uh, yeah, it's not going to be a number. I know it's yeah. not going to be a number, but it, what, you've got a number now. And But there, what signs or symptoms or presentations do I look for to say, oh, crap, this is now a really time-sensitive situation? Yeah, I, I, so it, it really is uh, mental status. I, I've been kind of talking about the brain the whole time. And, you know, kind of as the brain is sitting there, um, and, uh, you know, getting hit with this higher, higher increasing level of ammonia, um, it's starting to swell. And so if you've got somebody who initially presented with some vomiting and some, you know, altered mental status, a little bit of belligerence, whatever, and now that patient is starting to become, you know, obtunded uh, and then becoming unresponsive, you're very, very time sensitive at that point. You know, you've got to act very rapidly uh, because you're at risk of herniating. 
Uh, and so that that's really the, an important piece. Um, you know, I've definitely been engaged in cases where um, patients were um, sedated and, you know, kind of because they were uh, vomiting and, and really uh, agitated, they had their airway protected, so they were intubated. Now nobody knows what their mental status is, and they, they were kind of just sitting there waiting for a consultant, uh, and all this time their brain is swelling, and then they ultimately herniate. So, you know, I think that that's the number one thing. you got to look at mental status, and once they're, um, you know, kind of looking comatose, you got to move fast. And you, so this is the whole point of intervening early. So, and, and like what George is saying is the kids who present or the adults even who present later in life, they can have mild symptoms and maybe not terribly elevated ammonias and you maybe can fix them in the ER, right? Like, so we had this kid who was coming to our ER maybe every like two or three months with vomiting, was always a little lethargic at presentation, got some IV fluid, some some D5, and then looked better and was sent home three or four times. Um, And she had an underlying urea cycle disease that was missed. And then she presented to another ER in status epilepticus and, and, and did not survive. So sometimes it's, you know, you could fix them in the ER, but if you miss the diagnosis, they're, they're ultimately going to have, you know, a devastating, um, event. So it's, um, I think more likely that you're just going to miss it and, and not so much that you're going to have them with such a high ammonia presentation that you need to act. Right. The milder cases for sure. And so I, I think that, you know, again, that's the, the point of history. If you're seeing these kind of recurrent events, uh, that should make you think, you know, could something else be going on here? I think that's a big consideration because adults a lot of times will think about elevated ammonia levels, uh, but pediatrics is a little bit more of a nebulous. And especially if you've got, like my facility, we don't admit pediatrics, but we actually have um, OB services and, and, and NICU and all that other stuff. But once the kid uh, makes it out of the hospital, then they are on their own. I mean, they, they aren't admitted back to our facility. And so there's not a ton of pediatric activity. Um, a lot of uh, sick pediatric activity, but we do see some genetic and genital uh, related stuff bouncing back, uh, back in um, as well as, you know, that potential, my kid was born here, so we want to bring him here. And I think a lot of people may deal with that. And um, in the biggest challenges, and this is a good conversation with the ammonia levels and um, you know, some of these other disease processes, because in the community setting, it may be something that's kind of an out of sight, out of mind that we may not see enough to really have it on the radar consistently, but it may be something that, especially in the pediatric population, may be able to make a significant impact if if addressed rather early. Um, let's 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 see if you guys have any other thoughts. I mean, closing thoughts on uh, advice and things, take home messages the Cliff Notes version for the emergency physician and healthcare provider out there um, for elevated ammonia levels um, and uh, some of these disease processes? Yeah, so I think uh, from my perspective, you know, um, it really is all about identifying uh, these cases. We know that that there are cases out in the community that, that are missed because they're presenting late in life. And, you know, every now and again, like once a year or so, you'll get a newspaper story or some tragedy of, you know, somebody who had a surgery and had steroids and then you know, kind of was unmasked and, and had a hyperemia crisis and died or, you know, a woman after childbirth. Uh, so these metabolic stressors, I think that's an important point. Like if you look at the, the recent history, if there's some some stressor, um, that might unmask hyperemia. I, I was involved in this really interesting case of an individual who had a, uh, a motor vehicle accident and actually did, you know, relatively well after that, but was given a, a high protein drink, you know, for rehab, you know, to kind of promote wound healing. And that's what unmasked his uh, underlying metabolic disease, you know, became hyperemic and, you know, recovered, did well. But, um, you know, it, it's really what's happening around that hyperemic event that can be an important clue. Um, so, you know, kind of keep an open mind around that uh, for these patients. Um, and the other thing that we've tried to do at our institution is to um, get it, get ammonia into the order sets. So if you pull open an order set for altered mental status, um, vomiting, I mean, it's it's not automatically ordered, but it's there as an option. So it just kind of reminds you a little bit like, hmm, like, do I want to send an ammonia on this patient? Maybe, or, you know, maybe not, but at least it, it puts the thought in your head. Yeah. How can folks get more information or where should they go now that we've got them 
everybody a little bit tweaked up and the fact that everybody's thinking, oh crap, I don't want to miss this, especially in a kid. Yeah, so, you know, there's a, there's actually a great website called checkammonia.com, um, which was put together by the um, Nationally Recycled Disease Foundation, parent organization that supports uh, patients and families with urea cycle disorders and record artery disease. Uh, and so there are a lot of resources on that webpage, uh, in, including, you know, uh, signs and symptoms of hyperammonemia, how to draw tests, and, you know, where are metabolic geneticists in your state? Um, so, you know, that that's a kind of a, a, a page that has a lot of resources. And I think that, you know, that, that can be very helpful for folks. And any other uh, contact information that our listeners need to know about or suggested uh, readings or whatnot, um, or even if they have questions for you guys uh, following the podcast? So the Urea Cycle Disorders Consortium actually has got information for providers and for families. Um, so if you Google uh, uh, Urea Cycle uh, Disease Consortium, uh, UCDC, um, there's a whole web page with a lot of resources. Um, and, you know, it, there's a lot of specialty centers that are carrying out research. It's actually an international consortium. Um, so I think that that can be very helpful. The Internet's a beautiful thing. You know, there's a lot of information out there, uh, but this is really good quality vetted information. Yeah, there's a lot of fantastic information. You just got to know the context, uh, the context and, and where to find it and how to apply it once you get there. Uh, talking with uh, Dr. Karen Eigen and Dr. George Diaz. And um, hope everybody's gotten their fill of ammonia for the day and something to keep on your radar to keep uh, keep a lookout, especially uh, with those cases as they come into your emergency department um, and for that differential and also understanding how to avoid some of the pitfalls with the samples and results that may be in error. As for me, you can contact me, your everyday medicine, gmail.com, your everyday medicine at gmail.com or at everyday med on Twitter. And until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASAP frontline.